Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was part of the Avengers. Naruto left the elemental nations and wound up in a world where flying metal man, magic, and gods exist. Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel, and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Chapter 8, A Scary Plan Motel 6, Las Vegas, Nevada March 29, 2005, 1300 H. Wow, I haven't slept in a bed for so long. Naruto said to nobody in particular while stretching his body out like a cat. That's just part of the course. You don't need sleep, remember. Matatabi reminded. You're a lot like Gara when he was a kid. Good times, good times. Shikaka said with a sense of nostalgia. You were threatening the kid of taking his body over when he sleeps. How can that be a good time? Chome countered. Well, a good time for me, not for him. Sheesh. Shikaka defended himself. Shut up. It's too early for you broadcasting your infighting in my head. Naruto interjected before the fighting escalates. Kit, it's one in the afternoon. Karama deadpanned. Well, it's no more than ten minutes. Since I woke up, so it's still early. Naruto, Naruto said in a deadpan voice. Naruto sometimes thinks that he could relate to people with mental health issues, like say a voice in your head. In his case, nine distinct personalities that's capable of leaving his body and destroy a whole world. It's a good thing he can turn off the connection to the bijou, or he would seriously doubt his sanity by this time. He stood up and went to the bathroom. After washing up, he sat in front of the desk in his room and stared at the mirror, looking directly at his reflection. I have close to 1,000 clones in the city of Los Angeles still gathering basic information, none here in Las Vegas since all of them popped when they found a Class A forger while I was sleeping. Now, what should I do? Naruto thought to himself. When suddenly, he banged his head on the table. The holy grail of answers is in front of him. I'll place some reinforced siphoning clones with Horatian tags to all of the major cities in the world. That would make it a lot easier to move around. And if each of those clones can create more clones that can use transformation and my dojitsu, I can make an undetectable instant information network. It's going to be better than what Aero Senen has. With his mind made up, he walked over to the bed and unsealed a duffel bag and a backpack. Naruto placed 5,110 Horatian tags in the duffel bag and 511 reinforcement siphoning tags tags in the pack. He then created a shadow clone. Find an abandoned warehouse or building somewhere and place a reinforcement tag on you. You then are going to create another 510 clones with a reinforcement tag on them. Each one of you would then pick one major city and place 10 Horatian tags in any safe or you deem fit. Don't worry about Los Angeles. When it's all done, you're going to make an information gathering cell on that city and any nearby area. Try to get in as many classes as possible and read all the books in the library. Look into that internet too, if possible. Create and dispel a cl clone every day, or if something important happens. Got it? Naruto ordered with great enthusiasm. Visibly vibrating with excitement on the prospect of his new idea. Yes, boss. No problem, leave it to me. The clone saluted and shoe shined away, leaving an open window. What do you plan with doing with all that knowledge, Gaki? Duki asked with apprehension. He knows that knowledge is power and power corrupts. That much information flowing to one person won't be healthy. Well, of course, we're going to sell it. Naruto exclaimed with vigor. What? All the bijou shouted in shock. That way of thinking is totally out of character for Naruto. He's the kind of guy that will easily give up a lot to help the good guys. Baa-chan said that people would be really suspicious of what they've taken for free. So we sell the information on the bad guys to the good guys. 
That way we can help people while still earning some money. Smart, right? Naruto could clearly feel the gaping faces of the bijus. When the hell did you get that smart? Shikaku shouted. My little boy's all grown up. Karama said while wiping away a fake tear. Hey! I'm not that bad, am I? Naruto said the last part in a pleading tone. Well, you were pretty bad. Shouting about being Hokage all the time, running head straight to the enemy without thinking. Yup, you were pretty bad. Karama asserted. Well, fuck you too, guys. Naruto then stood up and sealed all his items except for the decoy bag. He walked out of the room and headed to the front desk. Room 225, checking out. Naruto said to the receptionist. Certainly, sir. That would be $62. The receptionist said after looking over the records. Naruto took out a $100 bill and handed it over. Here you go. Say, can you recommend a good casino? Maybe poker? Naruto asked, trying to find out where is the best place to go next. The Bellagio is a favorite for amateurs and high rollers. They have different buy-in buy -in tables from $1,000 to $1,000,000 on their floor. I heard they also host high-stakes poker with a minimum buy-in of $50 million. The receptionist informed Naruto. Well, here's your change, sir. I hope you stay with us again. Thank you. Naruto walked out of the motel. His first order of business get himself self a new identity or two. Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005, 1400 H local. Naruto is walking towards the house of who could make him a new identity. His clones heard about it from some crime boss talking about bugging out of Las Vegas, since the cops are hot on his trail. Further, research about the guy showed that he's a U.S. State Department, which apparently does something about international relations, employee, and a hacker, which means he can create legitimate clean identities, including IDs and passports. The perfect guy for the job. His services would cost $200,000 per identity. He usually wouldn't do transactions on a weekday since he is a government employee. Still, the clone's memory showed that the guy didn't come into work due to a foot fracture, which is certainly not the fault of one his clones accidentally dropping a pot on the guy's feet. Nearing the apartment building, he ducked into an alleyway and created two shadow clones. One of the clones transformed into a guy who looks a lot like Sasuke, and the other into his sexy jutsu form. Satisfied with the transformation of his clones, he and his clones walked towards the apartment building. Walking up the third floor, he knocked on room 303. Shuffle shuffling could be heard on the other side of the door. The door opened, showing a pasty, skinny, 5 feet 6 inches Caucasian man. Jeremy Michaels was an ordinary 23-year-old guy. He was working a dead-end 8-to-5 job for the government. Day after day, week after week, it was all the same. The operating word is was. One day, his uncle Martin approached him with a request. His friend was unwittingly involved in a money laundering scheme. The FBI is already on his tail. What he needed from him is to create a new identity for his friend. His job and his skill with a computer would make it relatively easy for him to create a new identity for his friend. This one request would grow into his new sideline job. He studied the bureaucracy of the government to create better paper trails. He bought equipment to make perfect imitations of IDs and passports. He managed to stay hidden by being smart. Only his uncle could contact him about the orders, and they always use code phrases. This made sure that nobody's the wiser. The fact that three people he doesn't know is now standing in front of his door is a little disconcerting. Are you Jeremy Michaels? The blonde guy standing in the center asked. Yes. Jeremy drawled out. I met this girl in the bar. Her boyfriend left her so now she's looking for a new phone. The guy said in a straight tone. Jeremy's heart rate immediately shot up. The guy he never met just said his uncle's code for a new job. 
Is he a cop? Doesn't look like one. Maybe Uncle Martin just let the code phrase slip somewhere. But how can he find out where I live? Either way, I can't bluff out of this. It's better if I let things play out. Jeremy thought to himself. The guy just stared at him while the other two are just looking around. Jeremy took a deep breath and said. Come in. I have some phones I can give away. The blonde guy smiled and just walked inside, followed by the intense-looking black-haired guy and a bubbly, hot, blonde chick. Chick. Jeremy looked around outside for a moment and closed the door. He hobbled his way to the living room and saw the three people looking around his living living room. Jeremy cleared his throat to get the trio's attention. He then pointed at the couch to allow the three to sit. Jeremy then walked over to a chair that faced the trio. There were a few seconds of awkward silence until Naruto broke the ice. Relax, Jeremy. We are not cops or criminals. We're just in need of your services. Naruto said to calm Jeremy down. People who are in need of my services aren't exactly clean. Jeremy countered with a little shake of his voice. Well, that's true. But you haven't met three abused siblings who faked their deaths and are trying to run away. Naruto lied using a plot in one of the books his clones read. Oh. Jeremy said, losing most of his tension. But how did you know about my uncle's code phrases? You're smart, Jeremy, but you have nothing on my sister here. Naruto pointed to his female clone. She can connect dots that don't even exist. And this broody guy right here, he worked out the rest. Naruto then pointed to the Sasuke look-alike. Of course, none of what he said was true. When the clone heard about the crime boss needing a new identity, he just followed the trail until it ended on one Martin Michaels. Finding no indication that Martin is the one forging new identities, the clone broke into his safe and read Martin's journal. That's where the code phrases and information was written. It is a foolish move on Martin's part. That's good, I guess. Jeremy said, thinking about how to work around the problem. If some random siblings can work out his side job and location, others can certainly do it too. Well, what do you guys need? He said, moving the issue aside and thinking about it for later. My siblings and I all need new identities. The faster you can do it, the better. I'll add 25,000 on top of your fee for each identity if you can produce the IDs and passports by tonight. There's another 25,000 for you if you can acquire us some high-limit credit cards by the same time. How about the paper trail? That would take some time. Jeremy asked, thinking about the work needed to make a high-class forgery. Don't worry about it. You can work on that at your usual pace. Naruto said while waving his hand about. Jeremy thought it over for over a minute. It would be tight, but if he postpones making the paper trail by tomorrow, he can certainly make it. The extra money would be an awesome bonus. All right, I can have it done by seven. I just need to take your photo and details. You can wait here while I finish it up. The blonde guy just smiled brightly, stood up, took his hand, and shook it vigorously. You can put my name as Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. The broody guy is Nathan Umber and my sister is Hannah Fox. That way, we can't all be traced if one of us is found out. You can do anything you want with it as long as no one would be able to link us to each other. Naruto said. Jeremy taught of the ways he can make the three identities separate. Okay, come with me to the back to polish up the details. Jeremy said after he stood up. Jeremy walked to the back room, shaking his head, thinking about the situation he put himself into. An energetic blonde, a broody brunette, and a cheerful chick. What weird group siblings. Well, at least it's not some assassin or a spy looking into him. Chapter 9, Hot on Your Trail Las Vegas, Nevada March 29, 2005, 1400 H Local Natasha is just finishing up her lunch. 
her self-imposed mission is still continuously eating at her. She can't concentrate on relaxing while she hasn't yet solved the mystery of one Naruto Uzumaki. Something in the back of her mind has been nagging her that Naruto is something special, hiding something big. She knows that Naruto would most probably be still in Vegas, the question is where. If she follows what Naruto said, she will find him in one of the casinos, otherwise, she has no clue. Giving up on trying to relax, she left some cash on the table and walked up to her room. When she got inside, she took both of her Glock 26 Gen 4, a Ruger EC9, a pair of carambits, spare shots for her gauntlets, and a couple of magazines from her case. She also retrieved her specialized ballistic mesh and wore it under her shirt, covering all the bulging parts with her jacket. She put her Glocks in the holster by the small of her back, her Ruger at her right calf, carambits at the left calf, and the spares and magazines at the inside of her jacket. It might be overkill, but to where she's going, she might just need it all to get out. She took her room key and valet ticket and walked out of the room, making sure to lock it behind her. She walked to the lobby and showed her ticket to the valet counter to call her car. When her vehicle arrived, she placed a tip in the jar and immediately got on and drove off. She drove until she reached a medium-sized Italian restaurant on the north side of Las Vegas. She parked in the restaurant's parking lot, got off, and went inside while making sure her car's locked. She strode confidently inside the restaurant and approached the maitre d'. Good afternoon. I have a reservation under the name Vinny. Natasha said confidently. The maitre d' slightly narrowed her eyes. She looked to the manager behind her waiting for instructions. Natasha followed the maitre d's line of sight and saw the manager talking to a walkie-talkie. She looked around and saw a CCTV camera pointed at the reception table. After a few exchanges, the manager nodded to in indicate to let her in. Mr. Bianchi is in the back. Straight through the kitchens. Have a good day, Ms. Vidova. Natasha is definitely sure now they remembered her. Vidova is Italian for widow. Natasha walked through the restaurant floor. She can see the tense posture of the waiters and the watchful eye of the manager. Shrugging off the attention, she continued to walk to the kitchen door. As soon as she walked inside the kitchen, everyone stopped. This place is even worse than the restaurant floor. All the cooks are giving her hostile glances while holding different sizes of knives, sharpening it, or cutting meat. If she were anyone else, they would have been shaking in her boots but she is not anyone else. She has seen where monsters are born. This intimidation is nothing on her. She walked past the kitchen and head straight to a meeting room, being guarded by two hefty guys wearing a suit with a BTMP9 machine pistol. I'm here to see Vinny. Natasha said to the guards. Both guards just grunted and opened the door. Natasha walked through the door. She saw ten guards with similar looks and load out to the guard she just saw. By the right side wall of the room is the CCTV monitor screen manned by a skinny guy in glasses. In the center of the room, there is a 3M diameter table. Sitting directly opposite the door, a massive older man leisurely eating a plate of spaghetti with a side of wine. On the opposite side of the man is another plate of spaghetti and a glass of wine. Have a meal with Ms. Vidova, or should I say, Ms. Romanoff? The man said, said. He saw Natasha looking at the food warily, don't worry, none of the food is poisoned. It's sacrilegious to waste good food and wine. He reassured. Natasha's face remained neutral as she walked to the table and sat on the chair in front of the food. She then heard the two guards outside walked in and closed the door, effectively cutting her off from her only exit. What can I do for you, Ms. Romanoff? It's not like you would come to me for nothing unless you just want to die, then that can certainly be arranged. Vinny Bianchi threatened. Vincent Bianchi or Vinny is a huge 70-year-old man with graying hair, black eyes, and large eye bags under it. He is the current head of the Bianchi crime family. He had expanded the family's operations through smart and efficient management, making the Bianchis gain control of Vegas underground. 
The bad blood between Natasha and Vinny came from one of the last jobs she did before being cornered by S.H.I.E.L.D. She was hired to assassinate Vinny's only son, Luca Bianchi, in the hope that the one who hired her can take control of the family during the confusion. She disguised herself as a high-priced escort to infiltrate Luca's penthouse suite. She drugged Luca with a paralytic drug and staged that he killed himself through hanging. The reason she was identified as the killer was through Vinny's stubbornness. He didn't believe for a moment that his son killed himself. He used all of his contacts until he came upon the Black Widow. The only reason she can go to Vegas without being continuously shot at or assassinated is due to an agreement brokered for her between S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Bianchis. As long as she doesn't wander into their area, the widow would get to live, at least that's how they phrased it. I need a favor. Natasha said, channeling her Black Widow persona. And why in the hell should I do this for you and not just put a bullet through your brain? Vinny exclaimed. Don't be like that, Vinny. You know it's only a job. It's just business, nothing personal. I'm sure you can understand. Natasha placated. It's personal to me. Vinny roared in anger. The guards hold on to their guns, guns, getting ready to attack their guest. Natasha remained calm and let the tension slowly die down. When the tension got it low as it gets, she finally said. I know you're going help me this, Vinny. Vinny took a deep breath and said. Now, why is that? Cause you'll finally get to know who hired me. The world stopped for Vinny. He always knew that the widow is only the hired gun, but with so many suspects, he can't do anything. He can finally bring retribution for his son's death. Tell me. Vinny said in a clipped tone, fixing Natasha with a hard glare. No, you're going to do my thing first before I tell you anything. Vinny thought it over for a moment. It doesn't look like it, but the widow holds all the cards the moment she said she would tell about who hired her. They can't force if of her since she'll just bring it to the grave with her. They knew her reputation. Sure of his decision, Vinny eventually nodded. Great. Besides, you'll forget all about me the moment I say who it is. I'm going to reach into my pocket and bring out a photo. Natasha stated, to not draw alarm. She reached into her right jacket pocket slowly and brought out a photo of Naruto. She placed it faced up on the table and slid it over in front of Vinny. I want information on him, mainly where he is. You have eyes and ears everywhere in this city. You're the fastest way to find him. His name is Naruto Uzumaki, if that helps. Vinny took the photograph on the table and looked at it for a moment. He stood up and went to the monitors. He motioned for Natasha to follow him. I know this guy. Saw him myself. But he didn't use that name. He used some weirdest name. Mama, Mana, Menma. That's right, Menma. Vinny looked, looked at the CCTV operator and said, load up all the fights of the champion last night. Vinny turned his gaze to the widow. See, this guy. Vinny said while waving around the photo. Is every fighting coach's dream. He can take punches, he's quick, he's strong, he's accurate, he has the experience, and most importantly, he's got skills. Natasha looked at the monitor playing a compiled video. She saw Naruto took punches that would bring down anyone else like nothing and throwing punches that knocked the air out of everyone else. The final clip shows a beautifully executed combination ending in a roundhouse kick. It was all she can do not to gape in shock. She finally has a confirmation of what Naruto can do. That guy took home more than 1.2 mil that night. Vinny said with a smile when the video ended. You organize fights with million dollar prize money? Natasha asked for confirmation. No, the tournament prize is only quarter of a mil, plus gate commission and bet commission. The most he can get is maybe 350k. Most of the money came from betting for himself. 100k for winning the whole thing, and another 100k for winning every fight in under a minute. Thought we just have another cocky guy with too much money. The widow just stared dumbfounded at the screen while hearing Vinny's answer. 
I'm going to take a copy of his fights. Do you know where he stayed the night? Vinny nodded to the operator. Last I heard he stayed at Motel 6. Checked out just 30 minutes ago. Vinny said, remembering the info. Natasha took the CD handed over by the operator and pocketed it. A deal is a deal, Vinny. Your brother Giovanni ordered the hit. He hoped you'd give up being head if your son died. Vinny and his guards took a moment to register what Natasha said. After a few seconds, Vinny said in denial. Why should I believe you? He's family. He won't do it. Natasha started to walk out the door and turned around. I got no, no reason to lie. I bet it's Giovanni who pointed you to my direction. Well, goodbye, Vinny. I have somewhere else to be. Natasha continued to the door blocked by the pair of guards. After receiving a nod from their boss, the pair opened the door and let the widow out. Vinny sat down and stared at the closed door for almost a minute. He finally regained his voice and said to his men, Looks like we got to clean house. Natasha drove away from the restaurant towards Motel 6, hoping to find another piece of the puzzle. Shield New York Field Office, New York March 29, 2005, 1000 H Local Coulson is now poring over witness reports. Every recorded statement is basically useless. Each account is the same. A bright flash of light occurred in Central Park. The weird thing was, there are no people anywhere close to the area, even though it's pretty close to a path. It's like everyone avoided the area at that exact time. Unbeknownst to Coulson, the seals placed on the anchor seal has an integrated repulsion seal. The Horatian Gate works by sending four chakra seals to a random world with the given a set of specifications. These seals would be used as a guide by the Horatian Gate to send someone through safely. A side effect of the anchor is it would create trees for each seal due to the high level of nature chakra used to power the gate. As a precaution to minimize errors and make anyone on the other side as safe as possible, a modified repulsion barrier would be formed the moment the anchor is set until the user is transported. Coulson was still reading through the files when a tech approached him. Sir, we have examined those marks on the trees. The symbols we can translate are endurance, love, of, sword. We have no idea of its significance. The important thing we found out, sir, is that the symbols are made up of smaller symbols. We only found out about it when we used a microscope lens on the camera. There are numerous repeating symbols. We can translate the words anchor, bridge, gate, and away. Away. Coulson immediately got a cold feeling wash over him. But sir, we hit a problem for one of your orders. The tech continued. What is it? We can't take any significant samples from the tree. We have taken some leaves and bark, but we can't take any wood core samples. We just can't cut into it. What do you mean you can't cut into it? Sir, we use chainsaws, diamond-coated blade circular saw, and even a laser. We can't even make a mark on the wood itself, only the bark. The tech reasoned. Coulson thought for a moment. Seeing that there really is nothing to be done, he said. Make do with what you have. Send a report ASAP. Coulson dropped what he was reading and walked to the balcony. He took out his phone and called someone. The phone ringed a couple of times until the person on the other side answered. Give me something, Coulson. Fury said. Sir, we might have a situation. Coulson said in a grave tone. We might have an alien on the loose. Chapter 10, Still Lucky. Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005, 1930 H Local. Naruto is now walking through the doors of the Bellagio. He just came from Jeremy Michaels's place, and now phase three of the plan is a go. He just got his ID, passports, and credit cards. Jeremy sure did go above and beyond since he got social security cards, driver's license from three different states for each identity, New York, California, and Florida, birth certificates and finally, permit to carry license for the guns this world loves so much. 
Jeremy also delivered on those credit cards. He repurposed some black market credit card accounts with a $100,000 limit to make them legit. All of which are billed to a P.O. box. Now, he can have a paper trail, which is apparently a fundamental concept in this world. He learned that someone without a paper trail is really suspicious. The hidden villages would love to adapt this so they can keep track of everyone. The only, the only downside to being a good guy doing bad stuff is that he had paid Jeremy 750 k for everything. If he really is an asshole, he would just do what Karama is saying. If you just used a Jinjutsu on him, you can vet away without him even remembering. Karama said. Well, I don't want to be an asshole, all right. Naruto defended himself. You bought illegally made papers and identification. Son Goku said in a deadpan voice. That's just a necessity because of my situation, and you know it. Naruto countered. Currently, he only had $483,374 left, which is a lot more than what he started with, but he needs some serious capital to get the next part of his plan started. That's the reason he was walking through the doors of the Bellagio. The receptionist of the motel he stayed at said this was the best place to play poker. Ever since he met Tsunade Bahan, he found out his talent for gambling. It doesn't matter what game it is, as long as it is based on chance. Even if it's rigged, he would somehow still win. As Karama so eloquently described it one time as you have a stupid amount of luck for things that barely matter. It's like you made Lady Luck your bitch, and she just can't say no to you. Now fate, that's where he is a little angry with. It's like it piled on all the enormous problems of the world on his shoulder. But he's not going to open that can of worms anytime soon, right now he has some games to win. Naruto went ahead and looked around. This place sure had a typical high-class casino down. Bright lights, expensive paintings, suit-up dealers, and security. Security everywhere, at least you can see their effort trying to blend in. He looked around and saw a sharply dressed attendant approaching him. Good evening to the Bellagio Hotel and Casino. The best place to relax and enjoy. How can I help you, sir? The attendant said, with a friendly smile. Naruto just smiled back and said the following in a conversational tone. Tone. It's my first time in Vegas, and I had heard great things about this place, especially about the poker tables. Can you point me to where those are? Thinking that Naruto is a customer easy to make money out of, the attendant immediately led him to across the casino floor. You are right on that, sir. We are known for exquisite poker rooms, equipment, and atmosphere. We have over 50 poker tables in the central area alone. We have several private rooms that can be rented for more private games. Both of them finally reached the poker room. The attendant opened the door for Naruto. Welcome to the Bellagio Grand Poker Room. We have increasing buy-in from left to right. You can join or leave a table after every round. The attendant pulled out a card and handed it over to Naruto. If you have any problems, just call the number on this card and find Ricardo Falcone. He can help you out. Good luck, sir. The attendant walked away and called someone on his phone. Mr. Falcone. It's Morris Grant. I just got a new possible mark. I'm from the Bellagio. Ricardo Falcone is an intimidating 45-year-old man. He is a loan shark working for the Bianchi crime family. He uses inside men in casinos to look for unsuspecting and gullible tourists to loan money to when they lose in the casino. He then cons or intimidates the target to pay back the money with significant interest. He pays the inside man a percentage of each successful loan. Morris is one of the more successful inside men due to the addictive and unpredictable nature of poker. He just has no idea that Naruto would be the worst mark he would ever have. have. Naruto walked around the tables, looking for an empty chair. He finally spots a man leaving his chair, and Naruto immediately ran to it and sat down. The dealer just stared at the possible new player for a moment. He's terribly underdressed. He looks like he lacks the decorum for this side of the room, 
judging from the way he ran to sit at the recently vacated spot. Nevertheless, the dealer is nothing if not professional. Sir, I would like to inform you that this table has $250,000 buy-in. The dealer said. Oh, perfect. I got the perfect table to start. Naruto swung his backpack forward, put his hand in, unsealed 250k in cash, placed it on the table, and turned the back again on his back. All of it was done with a broad, goofy smile. This should be enough. Naruto's action garnered a lot of attention from the table. Some were amused, others were offended, but the dealer remained professional. He just took the money and replaced it with chips. 50 pieces of $1,000 chips and 20 pieces of the $10,000 chips. Naruto looked around the table discreetly while arranging his chips. There are seven other players on the table, five males, two females. All of them are wearing fancy clothes. Stupid. How could I forget that? The clothes. Why didn't I buy any clothes? I'm standing out like a sore thumb. Wait, I don't need to buy clothes. I have a transformation jutsu. It's a simple enough hand sign. Ugh. Wait, I need to focus. Naruto shook his head and got back to observing his opponents. The table is set up as a half circle with all the players sitting on the curved side while the dealer is on the flat side. Naruto is sitting on the right end side of the table. Okay, let's work our way around the table, starting with the dude opposite me. Quite young, possibly rich parents. Based on his chips and the amount of nervous sweat he is forming, his parents know nothing about this. The next is a middle-aged guy. He's been cleaning house, almost a million in chips. Have to be wary of him. The following two are chicks. Friends. They also have quite a haul. Either they are good players or good at distracting others. I got to have a closer look at them. Naruto thought of the last part while blood is running down his nose. Immediately wiping the blood, he looked around the table around more. That guy must be in a losing streak. He only has enough for another two rounds. Okay, next one is an old dude with a hot chick sitting on his lap. Must be incredibly rich to have that hot of a gold digger. Finally, the guy next to me also has a good haul. Naruto finally ended his train of thought. Seeing Naruto is already settled in, the dealer started the game. Naruto was confused when everyone only received two cards. Ah, uh, excuse me. Are there three more cards? Naruto asked is in a low voice. Before the dealer could answer, the old guy with the gold digger laughed hard. hard. What have you been playing squirt is five card draw. Those are for kids and pussies. What we have here is a man's game. Texas Hold'em. The older man said with a loud laugh. Naruto immediately felt a feeling of dread washed over him. He has no idea how to play this. You can fold out of the game after the blinds, the five card poker tables are at the other side of the room if you're interested. The dealer helpfully suggested. Naruto thought about it for a moment until he made a decision. Naruto stood up and shouted. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. I don't back down against any challenge. Believe it. The people in the room just stared dumbfounded at the young man shouting. The security around the room don't know what to do and just stood there frozen. They finally relaxed when the guy sat down. Naruto phased out the world around him and took his guards. He had a ten and a king. Both of them spades. He had been assigned the small blind, which apparently means you have to put $500 on the table while the guy before him had to give $1,000 cause his the big blind or something. The middle-aged man raised the bet to $5,000. Everyone else called. The dealer finally showed the first three cards, twin aces, clover and a spade, and a queen spade. Naruto just checked since he had no idea what's happening, but the older guy had other plans. He raised the bet to $25,000. Naruto had no choice but to see the bet along with the other players. The next card is placed on the table a queen of hearts. 
This promoted another round of betting. The rich kid and the unlucky guy both folded. The old dude and the middle-aged guy are continuously raising the bet until Naruto had enough. He placed all his chips on the pot and said, All in. The two girls looked at each other and folded. The guy next to him folded too. Only the old dude and the middle-aged guy met his bet. With no other possible moves for the players, the dealer finally showed the river. It's a jack of spades. Confident with his card, the old guy flipped it over, revealing a nine of hearts and a queen of clover. Full house, queen over aces. The dealer announced. The old guy immediately turned his cards over before the middle-aged dude can collect the pot. It revealed as an ace of diamonds and four of clover. The middle-aged guy immediately slumped. Full house, aces over queens. Naruto's smile was slowly expanding as he watched how Texas Hold'em poker works. Lady Luck still has it bad for him. The old guy was already collecting the pot completely forgetting about Naruto when the dealer spoke. Sir, we still have another player. Him? Really? The kid didn't even know what he's playing. The old guy said. All be got in return was a blank stare. All right, all right. Just hurry up. The dealer turned his head to Naruto and said. Your cards, please. Naruto smiled and placed his card on the table. He looked at his opponent and turned over his card. The old guy looked like he just had a heart attack when he saw the cards. Ace high straight flush. Royal flush of spades. Naruto laughed hard and collected the pot. Several rounds of poker happened similarly. Naruto would win the pot as a whole or with someone else. One by one, his opponents checked out of the game, seeing they had no chance of winning with him on the table. The management of the Bellagio is already monitoring his games, watching for any signs of cheating. Unfortunately for his opponents, the administration had not seen any signs of fraud. Even replacing the dealer or the card dispenser machine yielded no results. They have no reason to remove Naruto from the game since the house would profit better with a significant encashment transaction compared to multiple small ones. Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005, 2230H Local. Naruto has been jumping from a table with lower buy-in to a table with a higher buy-in as he wins more money. Naruto was currently collecting his winnings from the last round in the $10 million buy-in table when a largish man in a suit approached him. Are you the guy who's ripping off all the tables? Hey! I'm not ripping anyone off. I'm just lucky. Naruto defended, ending the statement with a pout. The man just shook his head tiredly and continued the conversation. Anyway, my boss is hosting a private poker game upstairs. He asked me to pick up, and I quote, the kid who's been ripping everyone off the floor below. That's why I'm here inviting you. You can just stay here, but it looks like everyone just wanted to get rid of you. Naruto looked around the table and saw the pleading looks on his opponent's eyes that he says yes. Naruto looked back at the man and asked. How much is the buy-in? One hundred dollar mill, but don't worry. My boss says he's ready to prop you up. He just wants to see something interesting. Your boss is ready to lose at least one hundred million dollars? Naruto asked, dumbfounded. He's stupidly rich and bored. Happy said with a shrug. So, what do you say? I don't need for your boss to prop me up. I may have just enough from this table and in my backpack. Naruto collected his chips and placed them all in his backpack. He stood up and faced his opponents and said, Nice game, everyone. I hope we see each other again. Muttered grumblings are all the answer he got in return. Naruto followed the man outside of the poker room towards the elevator. When they finally are alone in the elevator, Naruto finally said, Excuse me, but can I ask your name? Sorry that I hadn't asked your name when we first met. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, by the way. Oh, by the way, who's, who's your boss if you don't mind me asking? 
The elevator door opened on the penthouse suite. It's all right, kid. I don't want to broadcast downstairs who's my boss. It might get wild. He just wants a quiet night today before he turns in it up tomorrow. The man extended his hand toward Naruto. It's nice to meet you, Naruto. I'm Harold Hogan, but everyone just calls me Happy. Naruto immediately shook Happy's hand with a grin. For my boss, well, you might know him. Happy hesitated. Don't leave me hanging here. Who is it? Naruto urged Happy to continue. My boss's name is Tony Stark. Happy said, waiting for the kid's reaction. Who? Chapter 11, Harder Than You Thought Las Vegas, Nevada March 29, 2005, 1500 H Natasha just pulled into Motel 6 parking. She still can't believe she got out of Bianchi's place without a fight, but she won't look a gift horse in the mouth. She got out of her car and went to the front desk. She pulled out a fake FBI badge showed it to the person at the front desk. Good afternoon. I'm Special Agent Naomi Ryan. I'm here to ask some questions. Natasha took out a photo of Naruto and showed it. Have you seen this guy? She said in an authoritative tone. OMG. Is he a criminal? Please say he's not. What if he's a serial killer and I'm his next target? The receptionist said, clearly losing her cool. Ma'am, ma'am. Natasha said, trying to calm the receptionist down. He's not a criminal. He's a missing person, and his family has been looking for him for over a month. One of my contacts said he spotted him leave this motel. Is this true? The receptionist took a deep breath to calm down. After a few deep breaths and said, Yes, he, he just checked out around two hours ago. Did he say where he was going? Not really. But he did ask where he could play some poker. I told him he could go to the Bellagio so he could go there. Thank you for your cooperation. Have a great day. Natasha pocketed her FBI badge and the photo and left. Natasha went back to her hotel to change into something more appropriate. She checked her car to the valet and went up to her room. Room. As soon as she locked the door, she swept the room again for bugs. Better be safe than sorry, and in her profession, being sorry might mean you die. When she got the all clear, she took out her laptop and video called Fury. Good afternoon, boss. I got a lead on the guy. Natasha said with enthusiasm. Forget about him, Romanov. I'm cutting your vacation short. I need you on the next flight to New York two hours ago. Fury ordered. Why? Did something happen? You could say that. Coulson just classified the 083 event as a possible 051. First contact. We have evidence? Nothing concrete as of yet. Only some markings on a tree are indicating that it's a bridge to bring someone in. The tree is a bridge? Natasha said, her confusion seeping through while she started packing up her stuff. Trees. Plural. Coulson would explain it better. That's why I want you and Barton to lead the search teams to confirm if there's a motherfucking alien in my goddamn planet. Fury exclaimed. Natasha hesitated for a moment seeing her boss so agitated, but she steeled herself and said. Boss. I'll take a transport from Nevada field office to New York at midnight, so that I can be in New York by morning. Why the holdup? Is this still about the hitchhiker? Didn't just I tell you to forget about him? Boss, I have a reason to believe he's a possible enhance, and he's already trained. I already sent you a copy of the underground fights he won last night. Natasha could see Fury rubbing his head while opening the email she sent him. She could see a slight widening of Fury's eye while watching the video, which in Fury's case might as well be dropping his jaw. A few more moments passed before Fury spoke up. All right. You can do what you want, but I want you in New York first thing tomorrow morning. Try to see if he's amenable to joining us. In the meantime, 
I'll have a team analyze the footage to have an idea on the guy's capabilities. Thanks, thanks, boss. Natasha closed her laptop to finish packing her stuff at the same time, picking out a practical yet appropriate outfit to where she's going. She removed her weapons and stripped down to her lace underwear to take a bath. When Natasha got out 30 minutes later wearing only a towel, she checked her phone. Well, that was fast. Natasha said, referring to the preliminary analysis of the video. The analysis of Naruto's capabilities is based on approximated data available in the video. The speed is computed using the approximated distance traveled and frames per second. The computation for strength uses the opponent's approximated metrics in calculating the force needed for a person to fly that far. The amount of damage Naruto can take, on the other hand, is a little harder to approximate since no reaction could be seen on Naruto. The result of the analysis is simply staggering. Natasha immediately dialed Fury's number. The call quickly went through. I take it you saw the report? Fury said in a serious voice. Is this right? I already thought his specs are extraordinary, but not this. Looks like you're right again, Romanov. But that's not all. I'll send you another file. It's an old report of an analysis of a video. Compare the numbers. Natasha immediately went to her email and read the report. Her jaw dropped when she finally saw the name on the bottom. Boss, he's better than the captain? Natasha asked hesitantly. In terms of strength and speed, definitely yes. The guy didn't even take the fight seriously. He might be a lot faster and stronger. In fact, I'll bet on it. It's like he's picking on kids. Fury said with a smile. Smile. The other things Cap had though, we have no idea. Only the lab can test for that. He certainly looks like he has experience fighting. There was a lull in the conversation until Natasha asked the thought that's running to both of their minds. Is this as bad as I think it is? The fact that someone may have managed to recreate a super soldier serum without even chatter about it, it's, it's really worrying. The fact that he might have worked as a contract killer is another negative. We might have another winter soldier scenario in our hands. Fury finished his thought. Keep me updated, Romanov. We have too many unknowns about this guy. The fact that New York is still not resolved, and we just had the green signal to study the cube, we have too many things happening on our plate. Natasha shuddered, just remembering the machine of a man who killed her client. Right, boss. I'll find him. Happy hunting, Romanov. I still want you in New York in the morning. Fury said before hanging up the phone. Natasha tossed her phone on the bed and changed into her chosen attire. She double-checked the room for possible things she might leave, and went down to the front desk to check out. Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005, 2230H Local. Natasha had spent just spent three hours, from four to seven, looking around the Bellagio for Naruto to no avail. Seeing no sign that Naruto would show up, she went around all the major casinos in the city looking for any sign of him. She paid especially close attention to the poker tables, since that was the only lead she got from the receptionist. Running out of time since she needed to be on the tarmac of the Shield Nevada field office by 12 to reach New York on time, she went back to the Bellagio for a last look. As soon as she entered the premises, she heard some conversation between employees. Damn, what I wouldn't do to be the kid right now. Tell me about it. I heard he already won around 90 mil. He's already on the 10 million buy-in table. I heard he never played Texas poker before, only five-card draw. At least that's what Jonathan said. Who's Jonathan again? He's the dealer of the kid's first table. He said what the kid's name is. Apparently, he shouted it in the poker room. I think it's Naruto Uzumaki. Natasha perked up and immediately ran to the poker room to find Naruto. When she got inside, she directly went to the high roller area. She saw a crowd forming one of the tables. 
Following her instinct, Natasha tried to see what's happening. When she was nearing the table, she saw through the crowd. The moment she saw the distinctive golden blonde hair, she knew she found Naruto. Unfortunately for her, fate had other plans. Natasha was just going to call Naruto when a man in a suit approached him. Immediately in guard, she readied herself for action. Hearing the man's offer to Naruto to join his boss for a private game of poker only made her more cautious, that is, until she finally had a good look at the man. He is Happy Hogan. The personal head of security of Tony Stark himself. According to his files, he has mediocre physical combat skills, situational awareness, and high-stress decision-making but more than makes up for it for his intelligence, intuitive leaps, and dedication to the job. He would rather die protecting Tony Stark than let him seriously get hurt. But the problem is not Happy Hogan himself, but with what his presence entails. If you can find Happy, you can find Stark somewhere close, and vice versa. The fact that Happy is already inviting Naruto to a game with his boss means that Stark is already in the building, and that means appro approaching Naruto is already a no-go. One of the founding members of S.H.I.E.L.D. is Howard Stark, Tony Stark's father. He funded a large portion of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s budget and created a lot of advanced technology during his time. When he died, his friend and another founding member, Peggy Carter created an unspoken rule that S.H.I.E.L.D. would stay away out of Tony Stark's life as much as possible, but would simply protect him from the shadows. Seeing Naruto walking away with Happy Hogan, she had no other choice and dialed Fury's number. Romanoff, are you on your way to New York? Fury asked as soon as he answered. Not yet, boss. Still got time. I hit a snag on the other problem though. Natasha informed with a little apprehension. What problem? Don't tell me to didn't find him. Don't worry, boss. I found him. I just can't approach him now. What do you mean you can't approach him? He's not radioactive. He doesn't have a force field. And he's certainly not flying. So, give me one good reason you can't approach him. Fury said, slowly losing his temper. Well, he's been invited in a private poker game. Natasha paused to let what she said to sink into her boss. By Tony Stark. Shit. Fury said in a word that perfectly sums up their situation. I don't know if the kid's lucky or unlucky. Fury took a deep breath and continued. We can't do anything about it now. Just go to New York. I'll assign a team to monitor the guy for now. Got it, boss. Fury hanged up the phone after that. Natasha left the building and claimed her car from the valet. She got in and drove straight to the Nevada field office, all the while thinking how hard it is to find a guy and ask a question. Chapter 12 Confirmation of Change Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005, 2315 H. Local. Who? Happy stopped and looked at Naruto incredulously. Naruto kept walking for a couple of steps until he realized his companion stopped. He looked back and saw Happy's expression. What? What? Naruto asked. You don't know who Tony Stark is? Happy asked to be sure. No, not really. Should I? Happy smiled brightly, hearing the answer. He finally could pull a prank and could take Tony's ego down a peg or two. Pepper would definitely love this. No, not really. Just remember that when you get in. Naruto nodded his head slowly, not really knowing what he meant. What can I expect in there? You have two CEO and two sports superstar in there. You might know the last two. Just don't let them intimidate you and you'll be fine. Happy advised. Here we are. Just follow my lead, kid. I'm not a kid. Naruto countered with a pout. Happy just swiped his card on the electronic lock and went in with Naruto following close behind. Naruto was awestruck at how fancy the room is. It's a whole lot more intricate than a lot of Daimyo's palace he has seen. Although it's a little much for his taste, he can't deny the allure of living in a place like this. 
He's so distracted looking around he didn't see Happy walk his way down the hall. Happy continued his way to the living room without seeing if Naruto was behind him and saw Tony and the other players still taking a break from their latest game. The two athletes are sitting on the couch while Tony and his friend are talking on the balcony. So, how's the rebuild going? You guys got wrecked this season. Floyd Mayweather asked his fellow athlete Kobe Bryant. Not great, really. The front office is making some moves, but I doubt it will amount to something anytime soon. Kobe replied. Kobe looked towards the balcony. Do you think the two over there would stop talking all about that techno shit? Kobe asked, referring to Stark and Musk talking something about a new battery configuration for Musk's Tesla. I don't know. I guess we have to wait for the kid to get up here. Sometimes Tony's too spontaneous. Who would want to play a poker shark? Happy decided to interject at that moment and shouted. Guys, I found the kid. Tony looked inside when he heard Happy's voice. He walked up to him and looked behind him. So, where's the kid? Don't tell me you lost him already? Tony asked, sarcastically seeing there's no one else there. Happy looked around, searching for Naruto. Seeing this, Tony asked again. Happy. Don't tell me you really lost the kid. Tony said, losing his sarcasm. His nervousness is seeping through. He was just right behind me. Happy said while looking behind him. I'll check back at the receiving room. Happy walked back to the front door and saw Naruto still looking around the reception area. I thought I told you to follow behind me. Happy said to Naruto while giving him a hard stare. Well, sorry. I just had to look around. Naruto defended himself. Happy just sighed and said. Come on. I'll introduce you. Just stay close to me, okay? Happy and Naruto walked back to the living room and saw the guys preparing for another round of poker. Everyone looked to see who Happy brought and looked a little surprised. They saw the kid is not exactly what they thought. He's tall, around 6 feet 2 inches. He looked like he could pass as an NBA guard. Got a muscular build too. Certainly looked like an athlete. He got blonde hair and blue eyes, but his face doesn't exactly look Caucasian. Maybe Asian American. Seeing the lack of awe and adoration that usually would show on a young man's face when he meets all of them, Tony finally asked. So who are you kid? Naruto looked at Tony. After a few tense moments with Tony waiting for that spark recognition, Naruto finally said. Shouldn't you be introducing yourself first? And I'm not a kid. Everyone in the room laughed hard. Sure, Kobe's and Floyd's egos are legendary, but it had nothing on Tony Stark. He lives to see his name everywhere. Someone not knowing about him is sacrilegious. Tony just gaped at the new guest. He never thought he would meet someone who didn't know him in the USA, especially in his lifetime. I'm Tony, Tony Stark. Billionaire, playboy, genius, philanthropist. CEO of Stark Industries. That Tony Stark. Tony introduced himself, hoping to himself that the kid would recognize him. Cool. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. The greatest Nina, I mean fighter around. Naruto introduced himself. Still not recognizing the younger Stark. Tony groaned, giving up on the prospect of the kid recognizing him. He walked back to the poker table, sat down, and sulked. The rest of the poker players introduced themselves. Hey. Sorry about that. He's a little vain. But don't worry, he's a good guy. The guy in a polo short defended Tony Stark. I'm Elon Musk. An engineer like Tony there. A tall, bald, African-American man introduced himself next. I'm Kobe Bryant. Basketball player. Played any basketball before? No, I can't say I have. Never even heard of it. Naruto answered in a straight face. You never heard of it. Oh, hell no. 
I'm going to have to teach you about it sometime. Kobe finally said. Forget about him. You do look like a fighter. You should do some boxing. I'm Floyd Mayweather, by the way. The shorter African-American guy introduced himself. Ooh. Boxing? I read about that one, but I never saw one use it before. What's it like? Naruto asked enthusiastically, finally learning something about his interest. Well, it's about using quick and strong punches to bring down the opponent while using fast and precise footwork to dodge your opponent. Floyd explained. What about kicks, elbows, and knee strikes? Well, we don't use it. Hey. I fought someone who used that. He didn't last long. You have more experience than I thought. What's the guy's name, maybe I heard of him? Floyd asked conversationally. Just some huge guy named Mike Lucas. Naruto said while waving his hand dismissively. Floyd immediately widened his eyes. Mike Lucas used to be a professional boxer who started the same time as him. He's on his way to super superstar stardom until he was caught using performance-enhancing drugs. He was banned from professional boxing ever since. Holy shit. You must be good. Where did you fight him? Everyone in the room is tuned into the conversation. They all heard of Mike the Flash Lucas. Hearing some guy fought him and won, even if not on his prime, is extraordinary. Well, there was this underground fighting tournament somewhere north of the city. Won me some serious cash. Naruto said proudly. You fought in an underground fight? Kobe asked for confirmation. Yup, lost my luggage and most my money when I got here. So, I joined to win some cash. The whole thing is a little boring though. Silence dominated the room hearing their guest's story. Tony, being the impatient one, finally broke the ice. Are we going to play or not? This snapped the people in the room, and they filed toward the poker table. The table. In the room is similar to the one in the poker room, only more expensive. They sat down with Elon on the left side of the table, followed by Tony, Floyd, Kobe, then finally Naruto. Tony saw Naruto swinging backpack forward. This reminded him of what he said to Happy. You need someone to prop you up? This table has a hundred million dollar buy-in. Naruto flopped his backpack on the table and looked at Tony. No need. I got this. Naruto said with a grin and tipped over his bag. Almost a hundred pieces of chips in different dominations spilled onto the table. That should cover it. For another time during the night, they were dumbstruck. The amount he spilled on the table is closer to 200 than to 100 million. How much did you start with? Floyd asked. $250,000. Worked my way up to the N million dollar tables. Holy shit, we're fucked. Elon said, perfectly encapsulating their current position. Naruto only gave them a bigger grin and said. Well, let's play some poker. Kamar Taj, Kathmandu, Nepal. March, March 30th, 2005, 1200 H local. The hidden temple of Kamar Taj is a school created by the world's first sorcerer, Agamotto. Agamotto was a powerful man who used the mysteries of the mystic arts to defend the world against enemies the world is not prepared to face. One of the most powerful enemies he ever faced is Dormammu, an interdimensional demon hellbent on acquiring planets for his personal dimension, the Dark Dimension. There was no chance for Agamotto to win against the demon if not for a powerful item, he forged using one of the most powerful objects in the universe. He named it the Eye of Agamotto. It's capable of bending time to the will of the user. He used it to push back Dormammu to the Dark Dimension. To prevent Dormammu of ever conquering the planet, he created the Three Sanctums as mystical shields against extra-dimensional beings to protect the world against mystical attacks from other dimensions, and alongside it, the Temple of Kamar Taj, tasked with training sorcerers. These sorcerers are soldiers trained in harnessing the mystical energies from other dimensions and use it to protect the world. 
Agamotto named himself as the Sorcerer Supreme and helped create a new generation of sorcerers. Before he died, he named another the title of Sorcerer Supreme to one of his students and passed down with it the Eye of Agamotto. This has continued for thousands of years until an unprecedented event happened. A, sor a Sorcerer Supreme saw a different future. The next adequate Sorcerer Supreme after her is not to be born for almost a thousand years in the future. Seeing no alternate solution, she harnessed the dark energy from the dark dimension to extend her lifespan. She had lived for so long that everyone called her the Ancient One. She had guided dozens of generations of new sorcerers, preparing them for what's to come. The Ancient One knew her time is coming, and she had already accepted it. Nevertheless, she religiously looks into the future using the Eye of Agamotto. She was prepared to see the same future, confirming what she already knew. What she didn't expect is the sudden change in the visions of the future mid-session. She can't clearly see who or what caused the change, only its effects. The only glimpse she found is a yellow fox. It's like an invincible mountain was dropped on top of the river of time, effectively changing critical events in the future one of those events, her death. She can finally see the events of what is to come after her death, and for the first time in a very long time, she felt fear. She saw the end of over half of the life in the universe. The Ancient One snapped out of her meditation and took a deep breath. She took her time to choose her next path. Either she does nothing and let destiny take its course, or she does something now and change what is to come for better or for worse. Finally deciding on her choice, she walked calmly out of her room and faced her attendant for the day and said. Call everyone available to the central grounds in an hour. I'll inform everyone of some of the changes that would happen. And bring me Kisilis, Mordo, and Pangborn. The attendant looked stunned for a moment. The Ancient One never called such a large meeting. Only meetings with individuals, or at most small groups. He stood there for some time until snapping out of it when he saw the Ancient One walking back to her room. The attendant ran through the corridor, remembering the Ancient One's orders. Back in her room, the Ancient One was contemplating the decision she had made. Seeing that she would not be able to reverse Destiny's path to what it was before, she comforted herself with her decision. Change has come. The Ancient One could be heard saying this in her empty room. Chapter 13, What the Hell Happened Point 1 Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada March 30, 2005, 1000 H Local Tony was sleeping peacefully until he was woken up by the most beautiful voice he ever heard. Wake the hell up, Tony. I swear to God. Shaking up the cobwebs in his head, Tony opened his eyes and saw something he never expected to be his angel. Don't make me throw this bucket of water at you. Ugh. Tony tried to get up, but his pounding headache begged to differ. Okay, you asked for it. Tony felt water splash his face, and he immediately shot up. What the hell? Tony looked around to see what's happening and where is he? He looked like he was in his hotel room. The weirdest thing was the only other person in the room is his personal assistant, Virginia Pepper Potts. Pepper used to work for another scientist entrepreneur until she finally had enough of the flirting of her boss and left. Stark Industries later hired her as an accountant for their finance department. Her diligence and detailed work in the department caused her to find some discrepancies in an account. After her immediate superior ignored her findings, she marched her way towards the office of Tony Stark to report what she saw. Pepper caused a scene at Tony's office when she wasn't allowed to meet him. In a natural reaction of Tony Stark's personal bodyguards, they pepper sprayed her. When Tony Stark got out of his office and saw the aftermath of the commotion, he laughed hard. This event would leave such a great impression on the CEO that he pulled her out of the finance department and made her his personal assistant, and more importantly, Tony gave her the nickname Pepper. Pepper continued to grow and develop being under Tony Stark's personal employ. This is not because Tony taught or guided her, no, this was because Tony basically put her through a trial by fire. Whether you love him or hate him, Tony Stark is an undeniable genius who appears once in a century. 
This genius caused Stark Industries to grow from a technological research company to a multinational conglomerate focusing on weapon manufacture. Tony's corporate ability enabled him to make the company flourished, but he was never enthusiastic about running a company. He only wanted to tinker and invent new stuff. This trait caused Tony Stark to place Pepper Potts in a position that would allow her to do basically everything Tony was supposed to do. Pepper's sudden predicament forced her to learn the ins and outs of the company. She expanded her studies while working for Stark until she got multiple masters and doctorates from Harvard and Yale, all related to business administration and management. Currently, she had more than enough credentials and skills to run any Fortune 500 company. Everyone else in the industry tried to hire or poached her away, but some part of her was always telling her not to leave her boss. Through the years, she and Tony have developed a good working relationship and an even better personal relationship. Pepper had somehow applied order to Tony's chaotic lifestyle. The only part of the job she now minds is she had to take care of Tony's one nightstand. But that's not why Pepper is so angry this morning. Why did I have to find out on the news that you and another guy took down an Italian mob while drunk? Pepper shouted. What? What? Ow, oh, not too loud. A hangover Tony asked. I don't know. All I know is what the news is telling. The Las Vegas Metro PD and the FBI are trying to get hold of you trying to make sense of a situation. Your lawyers are trying to contact you too. What the hell happened, Tony? This is one of the worst things you've ever done. Tony was seriously worried about what happened. He tried to recall what happened last night. He tried to remember what happened last night. Tony remembered that he, Elon, Kobe, Floyd, and his invite, Naruto was playing poker with Happy as the dealer. Naruto was destroying them until one by one they folded out except for himself. Flashback start. I'm tapping out while I still can. You're seriously like the pool shark of poker. Elon said while collecting his chips. I'm going back to my room. You should fold out to while you still can. Elon finished, referring to the small stack of chips on Tony's table. He barely got $3 million left while all the others pulled out when they reach around $50 million left. They saw that it was pointless, and they would only lose money to Naruto. Tony's only answer is a nod with a grunt. He is already a little bit wasted, indicated by the half-finished bottle of bourbon by his side. Happy is at the dealer's side of the table, absolutely enjoying the poker beatdown the kid was giving his boss. Elon said goodbye to both Naruto and Happy. He took one last drink and left. Tony looked back to see Elon go out of the room, thinking about folding out of the game right now. Only Stark's ego and overwhelming alcohol are pushing him to keep playing. He looked back at Naruto and asked. Next round? Naruto looked at Tony a little bit weirdly. He knew that Tony took the most hit during the game because of his aggressive game style. The chips he had left could only cover the small blind, but he has to cover the big blind for the upcoming round. Are you sure? Naruto finally asked. Cause I'm okay with covering the big blind, blind again. You'll just have to go all in as your opening bet. Tony rechecked his chips and saw that Naruto was right. He thinks over a solution for a moment until he finally spoke. I'll give you an open favor for one last game. All or nothing. What good is your favor? I got almost $350 million here with me. Why the hell should I say yes? Naruto said, baiting the CEO for more. Tony act offended at Naruto's statement. I'm Tony Stark. One of the richest and smartest men alive. I could literally put you on the moon, and here I am, basically giving you a blank check. Tony said exaggeratedly. As long as Pepper is not entirely opposed to it. Tony finished with a little fear in his eyes. Pepper would skin him alive if he gave another person one of those open favors without running it by Pepper first. Happy laughed hard when he heard the last statement. Who's Pepper? Naruto asked the laughing bodyguard. She's Tony's personal assistant and nanny. 
Happy said the last part as a joke. Naruto giggled a little bit at that, understanding the jab on Tony's personality. Naruto looked at Tony and said, Make that five, and you have a deal. Three. Tony countered while extending his hand. Naruto was going to shake Tony's hand, but before he reached it he said, Three in a room in your LA residence, and you're going to teach me engineering and computer stuff. Happy gave Naruto a weird look, but Naruto only shrugged. I just moved to the US, lost most of my stuff, and I have nowhere to go. This would solve that problem and learn something new. Naruto defended himself. Don't worry though, I'll be traveling for a while. Naruto then looked at Happy and said, you can even check my background if you like. Tony agonized it for over a second. He likes his solitary lifestyle, and adding this unknown guess might shatter that. On the other hand, the kid would like to learn something from him, and his ego like that. That was the tipping point. Deal. The two of them shook hands. The result was as expected, Naruto won without much difficulty. This caused Naruto's finance to grow to $410,489,374. He also got a temporary home base and three blank checks on one of the most influential men alive. Ugh, you really have the luck of the devil. Tony said while pouring himself another drink, looking at Naruto, packing the chips in his bag, almost making it burst at the seams. Leave it there. I'll just have the manager and cash it tomorrow. I'll even cover the fee. I own this place anyway. Really? Naruto asked. Seeing Tony nod, he just left it on the table. He then stood up, fixed up his jacket, and looked at Tony. Well, I'm leaving. When and where are we going to meet tomorrow? Naruto asked. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up there, sunshine. You just made me lose a whole lot of cash, a room, and a lot of my time in the future. At the very least, you're going to have a drink with me. Tony said, stopping Naruto in his tracks. But I don't drink, and I have to find a place to stay. Naruto countered. Nope. We're going to have a drink and talk like men. Tony said, urging Naruto to accept. When he saw Naruto sat down again, resigning to his fate. Tony looked at Happy and said, take the night off, Happy. You look like shit. Happy thought for a second before nodding and going to one of the spare rooms. What's your poison? Tony asked. I don't know. I only ever tried sake with my grandma. Naruto said. Damn, your grandma's hardcore. Tony poured two glasses of bourbon and handed one to Naruto. You should try that one. Naruto took it and stared cautiously at the amber-colored drink. He took a small sip at it to taste it. Hmm. Not bad. Naruto looked contemplative for a second before saying. Yep, she really was. I can't believe I only met her when I was 13. Why's that? I only met her when my godfather, which is also my grandfather figure, figure, tried to find her. She was something of a traveler and a medic. The thing is, she only stayed in bars and casinos even though she can never really win at gambling. Damn, and you basically win every time you play. Some weird family you got. Yup. So, what about you, what's your story? Tony swirled his bourbon before taking a swig. You really don't know, do you? He saw Naruto shook his head no and continued, well, basically, it's the same as other wealthy family stories. Parents don't have time for their kids. They died on a business trip when I was around your age. How old are you actually? 21. Birthday in October. Naruto said. You're lucky. You never said they didn't love you. What I would give to get a chance like that. Did they beat you or something? Tony asked a little cautiously. He's aware that there are a lot of people who have it worse than him. No. As far as I know. They loved me a lot. I just never had the chance to meet them personally. They died on the day I was born. 
Some huge calamity happened on my birthday. Took the lives of a lot of people in my hometown, including my parents. I only got to know their names when I was 17. Naruto said with a sad chuckle. There was a lull in the conversation, with both of them trying to cheer themselves up from the conversation. Got a girl in your life? Tony asked, trying to continue the conversation and stir it away from the heavy talk. You really think I would move to the US alone if I had a girl? Naruto said with a raised eyebrow. Well, I don't know. That's why I asked. Tony defended himself. How about you, you got someone? Naruto returned the question. No, not really. Only one night stands. Oh. How about that, Pepper? Pepper? Where'd you get that? We're great friends, I guess. But we don't have any, any romantic inclinations. Why not? Naruto asked. That simple question echoed continuously inside his head, getting louder and louder. Looking back, Tony would always say that particular question by Naruto changed his life. Naruto saw the blank stare on Tony's face. Being respectful, he allowed Tony to think over whatever he was thinking about. After a few more minutes, Naruto finally had enough and shook Tony to get his attention. So, what are you thinking about? Naruto asked with a sly smile. Nothing. Tony said a little too fast. So, what do you want to do now? Tony asked, trying to get the topic moving. Naruto taught for a second before removing a small calling card from his jacket pocket and showed it to Tony. You said you own this place, right? I had one of your attendants gave this to me saying that if I have any problems, just call the number on this and look for Ricardo Falcone. Want to look into it? Naruto immediately knew that the attendant is up to no good since he already saw a lot of those scams when he was with Tsunade. It also helped that Kurama said that the guy reeks of negative emotions. Being a little thrill-seeker himself and intoxicated, Tony only saw the good side of this endeavor. Oh, hell yeah. Let's go to security. Flashback to be continued. Chapter 14, What the Hell Happened Point 2 Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada March 30, 2005, 1030H Local Tony, talk to me. Don't think you can get out of this mess. Pepper said while pacing back and forth in front of the dazed Tony. Having enough, she snapped at him. Tony. Tony shook his head, snapping out of his daze and said, I never noticed how beautiful your hair is. Tony and Pepper both froze when the words left his mouth. He has no idea why he said it. Well, he has some idea, but now is not the time to linger on it. Did I just say that out loud? Tony asked with no one in particular, but Pepper nodded anyway. When Tony got his answer, he took a deep breath and said, Damn. Naruto seriously did a number on me. Anyways, where was I? You went down to security. Pepper said helpfully. And we're going to talk about what that Naruto said to you later. Can we not? Tony asked, hoping not to go through the mushy stuff that they would be definitely trudging through when that conversation continues. Pepper only gave him a hard glare. Tony deflated, knowing he already lost. Trying to retake hold of the conversation, he finally continued trying to remember what happened. Flashback continues. Oh, hell yeah. Let's go to security. Tony shouted while putting on his blazer. Why? Naruto asked. Well, do you know who gave this to you? Tony said while waving around the calling card. Naruto shook his head no. That's why we're going there first. We need to find out who gave this to you, and who's this Falcone guy. Oh. Okay. What are we waiting for? Come on. Naruto said, vibrating with excitement. Okay, okay, sheesh. Let me get my stuff first. Tony took his IDs and walked out the door. Naruto followed behind Tony with a hop in his step while Tony is trying to act sober. He led them straight to the office of the head of security. 
When they reached the office, Tony went right through the door without missing a step. Joey. How you doing? Tony asked the guy who was sitting on the opposite side of the desk. He didn't even notice the guy reaching for his gun. Joey Griffin is an unassuming 55-year-old, 5 feet 10 inches man with Irish descent. He has reddish-brown hair and green eyes. Joey was a Navy SEAL squad captain until he took a bullet to the knee ending his field career. He was going to continue to serve the military as an instructor to help mold the next generation of SEALs, but the news of his daughter's cancer meant that he has to find a more profitable job. This led him straight to being hired by Stark Industries to be head of security for its subsidiary, MGM Hotels and Casinos. He's been assigned as head of security for all MGM buildings in Las Vegas. His increased pay and premium insurance had allowed his daughter to receive the best treatment possible. The reason he was still in his office was that there are multiple VIPs currently in the building, especially his boss's boss, Tony Stark. Seeing Tony Stark burst through his door at this time of night was the last thing he thought would happen. He calmed himself down and tried to stand up. But before he could stand up to shake his boss's hand, he felt a knife on his throat. Holy fuck! Naruto! When did you get there? Get that knife away from him. He's the one we're going to meet. Tony said to Naruto, finally noticing him standing behind one of his security officers. And can you teach me? Added Tony a little hesitantly. Naruto withdrew his knife away from the guy's neck and pocketed his knife. He walked back to the door while still keeping an eye on Joey. Joey, on the other hand, was scared for his life. He only felt this kind of fear when Saddam Hussein's private guard captured him, and now there's this guy, whoever the hell he is. He never even saw the guy pass through the door. Joey rubbed his neck and looked at Tony. Mr. Stark, not that I'm not happy to see you, but why are you here, and who's the guy who almost opened up my neck? Joey asked, still alert from the previous encounter. Hey, good to see you're still alive. Tony said with an awkward laugh. And this guy here is Naruto. He's kind of the reason why we're here. Joey narrowed his eyes to the blonde guy next to his boss. All the bells in his head are warning him that the guy is dangerous. You want me to call the police on him? Joey asked, completely serious. No, not really. He's the guy who'd been ripping off the people in the poker room. Tony informed Joey. Ah. I knew he looked familiar. Joey said, still not relaxing. And he's go going to apologize for what he did, Tony said while looking straight at Naruto. Hey. He's the one who tried to draw a weapon. It's not my fault he's slow. Naruto defended himself. Ever since the war, he's wary of hidden weapons. It's better safe than sorry when it came to those. Joey tried to defend himself, but he knew he would do the same in that kind of situation. Naruto's answer just earned a look from Tony until he finally caved. Sorry. Naruto apologized while scratching the back of his head. Joey waited for something more, but he never got a continuation of that apology. After a few more seconds, he sighed and nodded. He then looked back at Tony and asked. By the way, why are you here, boss? Two things. I want you to look for the attendant who greeted Naruto when he walked into the Bellagio, and what can you tell me about Ricardo Falcone? Tony answered while handing over the calling card to Joey. I'll look through the footage. Joey said while scrolling through his computer. He then looked at Naruto and asked, What time did you get in? Maybe around 7.30. Naruto answered. Okay. Joey opened his desk drawer and retrieved a folder. He slid it toward Tony's direction. In the meantime, that's the file I have on Falcone and the Bianchi crime family. Does Falcone have a man on the inside? According to this guy, yes. Tony said while patting Naruto while looking through the file. He told me the attendant gave him that card and said to call Ricardo Falcone. Damn, thought I got rid of them all. They just grow like weeds. 
Joey said while still scrolling with the CCTV footage. Got it, it's Morris Grant. He's got almost five years with us. He said and looked at Tony, who placed the folder on the desk. I'll take care of it, sir. Have a nice night. Okay, have nice night too, Joey. Tony said and left. Sorry again about the thing earlier. Naruto apologized again before following Tony. When they re reached the elevator, Naruto asked. What now? Well, I saw three main locations for the Bianchi crime family. We can hit them all tonight. Tony said with a smile. Wait up. You're not coming with me. Do you even know how to fight? Or use one of those guns? Do you even have one of those? Naruto said while thinking about the mess bringing a civilian in a fight. Hey. Of course I know how. I'm the CEO of a weapons manufacturing conglomerate. I designed and built more than half of what we sold. Tony said proudly. Do you even know where you are going? He asked, knowing the answer. Naruto hanged his head low for that minor oversight. The elevator door opened, showing the parking garage. Tony walked to a closed gate and placed his palm on a console. The whole gate lifted, revealing two cars, a black Hummer 5 and a hot rod red Ferrari Enzo. Tony walked over to the Hummer's driver's side door and got in. Naruto followed and got in the passenger side door. Tony started the car using the key from the visor. He then opened the glove and central compartment, revealing an FN F2000 and a Beretta 92 FS, each with multiple magazines. Tony looked at Naruto smug and said, Yes, I have some of those guns. All right. I'm going to take point. You trail behind. Try not to use that on anyone. We don't want them dead. We wanted them captured by the police. Got that? Naruto laid out the plan. He could use shadow clones, but where's the fun in that? Why do you got to go first? I'm the one with the gun. Tony countered. You got almost no experience based on your reaction to Joey. You're a civilian. You're drunk. Take your pick. Naruto listed. Besides, I don't need a gun. I'm a close and personal kind of guy. By the way, can I have those shades? Naruto said the last part pointing to the Ray-Ban Aviator Classic shades on the dashboard. Sure, go ahead. Don't see the reason why you would need those when it's dark out. Tony pointed out the obvious ignoring the rest of the Naruto statement, but following his plan nonetheless. Naruto knew that wearing shades in the dark is stupid since it leaves you almost blind, but he's not going to use it to keep out the light. He'll use it to cover the change he's I would go through when he activates his dojutsu, Rinetensei Sharingan. Or simply Shinigan because the full name is such a mouthful, and the death god is such a massive part of his life. His own dojutsu is the result of the equal parts mixing of Senju and Uchiha blood, forming the Rinne Sharingan. The Tensigen, the final form of the Byakugan, much like the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan is to the Sharingan, was a byproduct of Kagaya Atsutsuki's blood mixing with his own. The process almost killed him, but he survived due to his Uzumaki vitality and Kurama's Yuki. The Shinigen combines all the best parts of the three dojutsus making it the ultimate dojutsu. It allows him to see chakra networks and tenketsus, 3D X-ray vision up to 10 kilometers away, eidetic memory, telescopic vision, and a whole lot more. Tony stopped the car next to an apartment complex. He took both of the guns and two spare magazines before he looked at Naruto. Seeing that Tony is gearing up, Naruto slipped on the shades and activated his eyes. He can see eight guys with weapons and an unarmed guy sleeping all on the top floor. You remember the plan? Naruto asked to confirm. Yep. I'm going to follow far behind you and try not to shoot anyone. Tony said. Naruto got off the car with Tony following behind him. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfictions. Looking forward to having you on board again.